Hey folks, Brian here again, and also shout out to Willow Smith, who helped me put this together. She actually does all of our assembly here for our prototypes. Um, this is part three of our creating custom PCBs talk. And uh, in the first two talks, we went over how to actually create, design a uh, PCB, and then get them uh, fabricated. And then this is the last part, which is actually putting all the components on and soldering soldering them up and uh, we'll be looking at the Klima board again and there is there's there's four ish steps to doing PCBA uh, so the first step is to actually take the solder paste and put them on put that on the pads and solder paste are little tiny tiny solder balls suspended in flux which uh, when you, which lowers the melting temperature of the solder and, and allows it to flow uh, and and then after you've put the paste on, then you've got to put the uh, components, the SMT, the surface mount components on your board. And then you heat the board up in, uh, in there's, some optional, there's some options of how to do that. And that melts the solder and uh, flows it. It's called a reflow process. And that welds the components to the pads. And then finally, after you've done the SMT, then you would go back and do any uh, through-hole component soldering. Now, for solder paste application, there's two basic op options. You can either do it uh, manually by hand or you can do it via a stencil. Um, we do most of our stuff by hand. Uh, unless you're doing volume production, uh, then it doesn't really make sense to bother with a, a stencil. Um, and also by hand is super, super, um, super inexpensive. And, it's, and it takes a little time, but it's, it's not hard. Either way, make sure that when you are buying purchasing solder for your assembly make sure to get low temp lead free solder low temp because it's a lot easier to work with and there's a less chance you're going to damage components when you're actually doing the reflow and uh, lead free because you don't want lead in your system and 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 they, it gasses off you know when it's when it's reflowing and chip quick is a great brand uh, that we use it's really easy to find uh, and you can get it on off of amazon and and um, seems to be really good for us now, there's two ways to uh, do, uh, or there's two, t two tools that we use to do manual solder uh, paste application. The first is that when you buy the solder paste, you'll typically get it in a syringe and it'll have a tip, and that's fine, and you just squeeze the solder on. Um, but we highly recommend um, getting a micro dot dispenser. Uh, you can buy that off of Tindy.com, and it, it's a little spendy. It's 30 bucks, but boy, does it make a big difference. It's very, very precise in, in how much um, solder comes out, and you can hold it a little more naturally like a pencil rather than having to like jam your thumb and, 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 and do that. So definitely recommend that. That's a real hack um, and super useful. If you're looking at doing stencils, um, the <clears throat> stencils are great. Uh, they are the fastest way to apply solder, and they're very reliable, and, and you wind up with very high-quality solder paste application. The first thing is that unless you're doing more than like five or ten boards, I wouldn't even bother with it. Um, it doesn't really make it's not doesn't it doesn't make a whole lot of sense um, for just a couple of boards. It's also very expensive up front, so you have to buy kind of a bucket of solder, um, a container, and it's much more expensive than buying a little syringe. And they're usually it's usually fifty to seventy bucks. Uh, and then you need to order your stencils. Uh, you can either get them, you know, you can uh, get them laser cut, which is about 150 bucks, or you can laser them, at, or you can you can make them at home with a laser cutter or a vinyl cutter. Um, but both of those obviously require that you have those uh, machine tools, and those can be pretty spendy. And also, while you can do stencils by hand you can um you can line it up and and if you've got bolt you know you got bolt holes and you can put something through the bolt holes you can um you can do it without a stencil machine but a stencil machine is really highly recommended and especially if you're doing multiple boards you know which you typically would be doing you'd be doing volume production um you really want a stencil machine and and, and this is uh, the stencil machine we use on the right and it's about the cheapest stencil machine you can get and it's after shipping, it's all, it's almost a thousand dollars. So again, I unless you're doing, you know, if you're going to be doing a production run, I wouldn't bother with stencils. Um, when you order stencils, 
for a machine like this, you want to get a frameless, or if you're doing them by hand um, and trying to align them, then you want frameless stencils. Framed stencils all have their edges bent up and they sit inside a container and then the machine, this is for like high-end machines that automatically sp spread the paste like in a, in a high volume production environment. Now, for the reflow step, there are a number of options. Um, our number one recommendation is to get a hot plate. We'll talk about options there. There's other options as well, which is you. Some folks have hacked toaster oven into oh, toaster ovens into reflow ovens, and these are these are okay. They can be temperamental. You, if you're doing uh, components on both sides of your PCB, you basically have to use a reflow oven. But generally, you're not doing that. On, uh, on at home designs. And honestly, if you're doing designs that, that need components on both sides, it's because you're really trying to pack them into a tight space. And that's really more of like a final uh, production design. And I would have those professionally assembled, uh, you, you, honestly. There's, the other option is to use a hot air rework station. And this blows hot air over the components. And, and that's 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 doable. It's better for like reworking. That's better for like pulling a component off and and reapplying solder and putting them back. It's not great for doing your um, main assembly, but it's good to have a hot air rework station to be able to rework um, components that didn't didn't solder well. Our recommendation is to get a professional hot plate, and and the reason why we say this is that they have really good precise temperature control and they're not actually that expensive so they're about 80 bucks on amazon for a decent one and and um you know the whole setup is is about 100 bucks that's including your solder paste and some tweezers you can also use just a regular old hot plate that you would like make tea or your eggs on in the morning um you know get an old pan from a thrift store or whatever and and a lot of folks do this at home and are very successful uh, for the price difference, you know, it's only, it's about 60 bucks difference between this and a pro one. I do recommend getting the the professional one just because it's the, the temperature control on this isn't as precise. And you really you got to you. you I, I think once you get to know your hot plate, then it works a little bit better. But it takes a little bit of time, a lot of uh, trial and error. But this will work. And a lot of people actually do the use these successfully. So, you know, your mileage may vary. Now the actual, when you're um, when 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 you're ready to do the reflow, so so you so we've put the paste on there, and um, we've either done it via stencil or we've uh, squeezed it on there, and you and you've placed your components, and there's no magic to that. You basically take your tweezers and put your components in, in place. Then this last step is to actually do the reflow, and 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 to do that, you basically bring your uh, bring your hot plate up to a warming temp, um, a pre pre warm, and that's typically around 180 degrees. But you can look at your solder. Your solder will have a temperature profile, and 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 typically what you do is you bring it up to that temp. You put your stuff, you put your board and all the components already installed on the hot plate, and then you bring it up to whatever the temperature of the the melting point of your solder, plus about 10 percent. You need a little bit of overage. Um, sometimes you can skip the re the warm warming step and you can just turn it up to 10% above your solder melting point and then just put your stuff on there. And then what what you want to do is you want to let all the solder melt. And you can see here in the image there's this is sort of before this is when we first put the solder on there and it's just starting to melt. You can see it's getting shiny. And then here it is on the right when it's finished. So that you can tell that that the flux has um, gassed out and the solder's all melted and very shiny. And, and that usually takes 10 to 30 seconds, depending. Um, and then once you've, once you've done that, then you turn off your, your hot plate and um, use tweezers or something to pick your, pick your hot board up and then take it off and put it on something to cool, typically on like hot silicone, silicone or um, a silicone, a silicone mat, like a soldering mat, or even just a piece of wood or something that you don't mind that it, it might uh, um, brown up or whatever, it's, it's, it's fine. 
So that's that's it. It's very easy, um, and this is really, like I said, a, uh, a, a practical guide for doing this at home. The final step is that if you have uh, any through-hole components, then you want to finish off with your through-hole soldering. And we're not going to well, we're not going to cover that in here because by the time you're doing the SMT stuff, you're probably already familiar with um, through-hole soldering. But if you are not, check out our video on YouTube, and you can check that out. It's very easy. So. Thank you for joining, and this concludes our, um, you know, our, our three-part on creating your own PCBs at home. I hope it was useful for you and give you a good introductory uh, understanding of how to do this, and 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 also just, you know, it's it's very practical. You can if you if you followed through these three videos, I think you should be pretty comfortable to try this at home and and know that you can do this. This is something that that is pretty easy to do and there's a little bit of trial and error and you'll get to you know you'll get to sort of get the feeling of of your of your designs and your and the process and whatnot but it is very easy and it's very simple to do at home with very um very it does not it doesn't have to be very expensive at all so again thank you very much for joining and uh, best of luck on your hardware assembly and creation journey thanks